Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to wax philosophical about DevOps a little bit this morning. And to start with that, I'm going to start things off by talking about burnout, not because I want to necessarily be super negative first thing in the morning, though that is my general state of being this early in the morning. But rather, I find myself continuing to talk about burnout. I notice that in the industry, there are frequently talks about burnout. And so it feels like this is an area where we could probably stand to think about it a bit more. I think my clicker is burnt out. To cheer you up, here is a picture of a cat who is definitely not too burnt out to attack a toy mouse. When we talk about burnout, we are not just talking about being stressed or busy or having too many deadlines. We're talking about a state of physical and mental exhaustion, a lack of efficacy, increased cynicism, kind of the state of everything is terrible and I just don't have the energy to fix it and I am out of energy to care anymore. It's not really a great state of being in, being so disconnected that you really can't engage with your work or even your life outside of work. There we go. Burnout is something that I have struggled with myself over the years. I feel very lucky that I've been supported enough in my workplaces to be able to, to talk about this publicly, to be able to get up on stage and be like, yo, I'm kind of on fire right now. Can we talk about this? And a lot of the times when I was struggling with burnout, it came from feeling really, really disconnected. Whether that was something like having to be closeted at work or feeling like I wasn't part of a team, like I, was a, I spent several years being a one-person ops team and feeling like I was the only person who really cared if the data center was literally on fire, feeling like I was just not really part of a community, that I was really disconnected from people around me. Dr. Christina Maslach is a researcher who has done a lot of work looking into burnout. Uh, and she identified these six key areas where if there is a disconnect or a mismatch in between a person and their work environment, it can really exacerbate and contribute to burnout. So the first area is workload, which is what people tend to reach for first when we talk about burnout, the idea of, oh gosh, I have too much to do and too many deadlines and everything is chaos. That can definitely be a contributing factor. Um, on the flip side, if you don't have enough work to keep you busy or your work isn't challenging or engaging, I at least don't want to show up to work every day and be bored and have nothing that feels meaningful to do. There can be a sense that you don't have enough control over your work environment. You might have a manager who is micromanaging you or it might feel like you just don't have any sort of say over the, the work that your team is doing. You might not feel like you're getting rewarded. That might look like, oh, your company isn't paying you an industry standard salary, or the sense that your work isn't getting recognized can, can be a, a problem with rewards. A sense of fairness, feeling like you're not being treated fairly, that's often a big one, you know? Having somebody else on your team who they're the person who gets all the fun projects, or they're the one who gets all the, all the recognition, and feeling like, you know, you're not really on a, on a level playing field like you should be. A disconnection of values can, can be another big one, whether it's you don't see eye to eye with your manager or your team on what sort of work is important or valuable, or feeling like, you know, you, you disagree with your company as a whole on, you know, how they do business. I, you know, my first ops job was working for a startup that had a lot of advertising practices that I didn't necessarily agree with, and that was kind of hard to sit with on a day-to-day on -day basis. And then there's community, kind of like I talked about, feeling like you don't belong in, in your team or in your organization as a whole. So I think the way to kind of think about reversing this is look for ways that we can connect people, to find ways to help people feel like they're more effective, that they can be optimistic, and that they have energy again. So this is why I want to talk about this, because I don't think it's really the right approach to address burnout only from an individual level. 
approaching one burnt out person at a time and putting out those fires, we need to do that, but I don't think it's the answer to kind of systemic problems that we might be seeing as an, in as an industry. A big part of what I really like about the DevOps community is seeing how it creates connections. Back when I was a one-person ops team and I was all by myself in the data center all day, every day, and it was sometimes literally on fire and nobody else seemed to notice or care, I found the DevOps community on Twitter and all of a sudden like, I felt like I had found my people. I had found people who were facing similar challenges or who cared about the same things, had similar priorities, and we got to talking and I got to become a part of this community. I went to my first DevOps Days event, I think in 2012 in New York, and it was this wonderful sense of kind of coming home, if you will. So in the book, uh, Effective DevOps, that I co-wrote with Jennifer Davis, we came up with what we describe as four pillars of effective DevOps. We did a bunch of research, formal and informal case studies, and we came up with these four key characteristics that we've found in organizations that kind of do DevOps well, that have these strong connections. We start out with collaboration. And here we're talking about individual people working together with shared interactions and input, building towards a common goal. And this is usually a common team goal. So people on the same team working together to try and get done what the team needs to get done which might sound pretty basic, but as it turns out, if you are unable to get people on the same team to work effectively together, you're gonna to be pretty hard pressed to get people on different teams to be able to work together with any measure of effectiveness. We move on to affinity. This is building now inter-team relationships, kind of developing empathy and trust in support of shared organizational and business goals. So now this is what people really typically think of when they think about DevOps is the dev team and the ops team working together, not throwing stuff over the wall and making each other really sad. Of course, we have to talk about tools. Jennifer and I view tools as accelerators of culture that can enhance and support collaboration and affinity within the overall culture in between individuals, in between teams, but we don't view any one tool or set of tools as the answer, and we don't, we don't advocate for that. Tools reinforce culture, but they cannot replace it, and they cannot fix a broken culture. If you have a culture where there is so little trust that people don't communicate, that they refuse to really talk to each other or tell each other anything, switching up which chat system you use is not actually going to fix that, unfortunately. And finally, we talk about scaling. Now, we're not talking about some magical web scale enterprise DevOps that's somehow different from regular DevOps because that's not a real thing. But we're talking about applying the previous three pillars, collaboration, affinity, and tooling, throughout the various inflection points of an organization's life cycle. Because you can't just sit to yourself and say, OK, we, we did the DevOps. We checked that off. We have got a DevOps now. We're done. We don't need to worry about it anymore. Your organization is going to grow and change. And it's important that you be able to, as teams, as an organization, identify what your problems are and figure out how to apply these considerations to start to fix those problems throughout your organization's life cycle. So we have these four pillars, and ultimately, what they do is they help us create connections. Whether that is connections between individual people sharing perspectives and ideas, connections between teams that might have different goals in a, on a small scale but are overall working towards the same organizational goals, connections with your customers to help better understand them, help them solve their problems, or connections like with the industry as a whole, like at conferences like this, where we share stories with, with each other to try and make each other more, more effective. Now, this used to be the point in this talk where I would go through a list of things that I had seen be really helpful in creating connections through organizations in kind of a 
developing and maintaining this sort of DevOps culture. I'm not going to do that list today because I feel like while those ideas were really good under certain circumstances, it started to feel like the focus was too narrow and I was being a little too prescriptive. My organization is not your organization. Even organizations of the same size, of the same scale, are not going to be facing the same problems. So I can't stand up here and tell you what are your most important organizational problems to solve right now. There is no one-size-fits-all DevOps solution. There is no one way that you can just do the DevOps. And I understand that you know sometimes if you're struggling, if you're feeling burnt out, if you're in the, in the organizational weeds and you feel like you've got so much technical debt and cultural debt and process debt and everything is just fire, it can be really tempting to say, like, person on the stage, please tell me how to do the DevOps so we can check that off and go back to shipping software because I'm tired of the fire right now. But that doesn't exist. What I can do, however, is give you a pithy collection of words. Uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer, who is definitely not a member of a DevOps cabal, requested on Twitter a couple weeks ago that the DevOps cabal, which emphatically does not exist, should come up with a pithy collection of words that we can all agree on, and then we can do DevOps perfectly, and everything will be wonderful. As somebody who is definitely not a member of that cabal and who doesn't have opinions on things, I decided to try. He did not say that the pithy collection of words had to be a complete sentence, so here's some words. Safety, empathy, communication, decision making, problem solving. All right, we've, we've, we've figured that out. Everyone can go home, good talk, except it's a bit too early for that, so I should probably try to explain why it is that I picked these words. And when it came down to it, it's because when I went through all of the suggestions that I had given in previous versions of this talk for how to make organizations more connected, they all came down to some combination of these things. Now, I don't know if the rest of the non-existent cabal is going to agree with these words, but they re really resonate with me, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about why. I want to start out by talking about safety. The idea that you can take risks, that you can suggest new ideas, you can speak up, you can disagree with people in a you know, respectful, healthy way. You can admit when you don't know something or when you made a mistake and not have there be negative repercussions. I have talked on at, at previous conferences about the time that I single-handedly nearly took down Etsy.com by accidentally upgrading Apache everywhere. <laughs> that was a safe environment where I was able to, when I noticed that I had done this, be like, uh, hey, friends, so I just broke everything. Who wants to help me fix it? It'll be fun. And the response that I got from my colleagues was, this is fun. How can we help? Instead of, oh God, you broke the site, like, we're, we're not talking to you anymore. That sort of safe environment. Google published a study in 2017, I think it was, and it showed that the highest performing teams that they had were the ones with the highest amount of psychological safety. Teams need this and people need this. Because when you don't feel safe, you get stuck in this uncomfortable, amygdala hijacked, fight or flight response sort of state, which is exhausting and it is disconnecting. It is a recipe for burnout and not necessarily getting good work done. I don't have time to go into all of the research that they did, but the TLDR is that psychological safety requires, and I'm paraphrasing here, requires people to have a mindset of curious collaboration with fellow humans. So curious, thinking about curiosity rather than blame. Like, oh, interesting, what were you trying to do? Rather than, oh God, why did you take down the site? A base assumption of collaboration, of we are trying to work together rather than an adversarial mindset. And viewing each other as humans. We're all people here. We're not just email addresses or Slack handles or GitHub handles or what have you, but we're people. And it's important to be aware of that. So looking for ways to make your teams and organizations safer, be curious about what people are thinking, why they make the decisions that they make. 
be blameless or blame aware, however you want to phrase it, with very few exceptions, people don't come into work to try and make mistakes, to try and do a bad job. So when things inevitably go wrong because we are humans and computers are terrible and bad things happen, try and be blame aware and look for ways to learn from these sorts of things. And then pay attention to incentive structures within your organization because it's one thing to say like, yeah, we're gonna be blameless, but if people are throwing their colleagues under the bus and those people are the ones who, getting, who are getting promoted, you know, that says something about values in, in practice versus values in theory. So I talk about empathy a lot. I hope we can all agree that empathy is a good thing and that I don't have to convince you of that because that starts to feel like I'm beating a dead horse or shaving a shaven yak or something like that. I keep coming back to this quote. Uh, Jeff Susna wrote a blog post in 2014, Empathy as the Essence of DevOps. And he said, Empathy allows software makers and operators to help each other deliver the best possible functionality and operability on behalf of their customers. And then this morning, I was awake since 4 a.m. because I flew in from Berlin and my body doesn't know what time zone it's in, and somebody tweeted, retweeted this into my feed. The craft of programming begins with empathy, not formatting or languages or tools or algorithms or data structures. So if it's on the internet, it must be true. Finding ways to practice empathy. Listen to each other, learn from each other, ask questions, appreciate that people are going to have different backgrounds and perspectives and look for ways to, to connect with each other, to find the commonalities that we have between us so that we can really learn from each other. Again, approaching people with curiosity for their ideas, approaching them with care for their humanity and their experiences, and building structures to support people. And again, pay attention to what is rewarded or, or what is kind of done within your organizations. I like to think about um, being able to take time off as an example of this. Time off is something that we give to support each other to, for the fact that you know, we are humans and we have lives outside of work. But if you have an organization that you know, has an unlimited vacation policy and nobody ever takes vacation, that's not an organization that is actually that as supportive as it could be. So once we have these two things, once people feel safe enough to open up and share ideas and we can empathize with each other, we can start to get into how organizations communicate. This is still true. Tools are still not going to fix a broken culture. So I'm not gonna talk about specific tools or very specific communication patterns, but rather I'm gonna talk about kind of the how and why we communicate in general. I lied earlier, I am going to briefly talk about the list of things that I used to talk about in this talk, albeit much more briefly this time. Uh, when you, you can do some, something when people start in an organization, you, they can do a boot camp working with um, members of another team that isn't the team that they would ordinarily work with. Uh, you can do rotations where people on some sort of regular cadence, spend time working on another team. Uh, Etsy did a program called Senior Rotations where once a year you could go spend a few weeks working on any other team within engineering, assuming that you know, the timing worked for your team and their team. Um, or you can do something like uh, quarterly customer support rotations uh, to give engineers a feel for what the support folks within your organization are dealing with. And these things that I used to talk about were all patterns or structures that were designed to foster ongoing communication throughout an organization. Now, in order for these patterns to work, people need to be able to listen to each other and people need to be willing to learn new things. You know, if I come back to my team and say, hey, I was like rotating with this other team and they had this cool new process, can we try it out? It helps if my team is willing to listen to me and at least consider whether that might be a good way of doing things or something that is worth trying. Now, I am not talking about diversity of thought here where people think that they should just get to be completely bigoted and have that be okay at work because it's diversity of ideas. I am not talking about that. What I am talking about is people willing to have a growth mindset and to accept that 
because it's the way we've always done things, is maybe not the best way of approaching problems. So, decision making. Eventually, your organization is going to have to make decisions. And I think that one of the signs of a really healthy organization is having a, a larger number of people whose opinions and suggestions actually get listened to. In order to feel connected within your organization, you have to feel comfortable speaking up, and you have to have some sort of, of trust that people are going to at least consider what you have to say. This doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is always going to agree with you, you're not necessarily going to get your way on every single decision that comes up, but you need to believe that people are le at least gonna consider it because if you just feel ignored and that any time you suggest something, people are like, no, no, that's, that's not a real suggestion. Adults are talking here. You're gonna start to feel really disconnected and burnt out. So encourage people within your organization to seek out feedback on their ideas. And I think it's important to think about power structures here. Like we all expect an intern or a junior engineer to seek out feedback on their work but I think it's important that you have senior engineers or senior people of whatever field within your organization who are willing to seek out and listen to feedback as well. Because you don't want a group of senior engineers who think that every idea they have is amazing and perfect and won't listen to anything else. Encouraging new or junior people to contribute. Watch out for having an old guard that is like, well, this is the way that we've always done things and it is the best way and there is no possible better way anywhere, so let's not even talk about it. And find healthy ways to disagree. Up to a certain point, disagreement within an organization is actually a good sign. If you don't ever have people disagreeing, that means that either you've hired a monoculture where people just literally don't have any different ideas, which isn't a good thing, or you have an environment where people are afraid to speak up if they say something that is outside the status quo, which is not great either. So pay attention to how people disagree. There are you know, healthy and unhealthy conflict styles. You want people to talk about the ideas that they're saying, not make personal attacks on each other. But make sure that people can disagree and that you know how to handle conflict in a healthy manner. Now, sometimes I've heard people say, well, we have a, we have a flat org structure, so we don't have those sorts of like senior, junior things that you're talking about here. Having hierarchies not be explicit does not make them go away. I have worked at places that were completely flat on paper. In theory, they had no hierarchy. In practice, the hierarchy was whoever had been you know, in the same fraternity as the CTO in college, they were the ones whose ideas always got listened to and they got all of the fun projects. There was a hierarchy there. But the fact that it was implicit made it a lot harder to reason about. Ultimately, what it comes down to, you have people communicating, feeling safe to share different ideas, having those ideas be listened to. You have to make decisions. And that comes down to agreeing on what is important. Who gets to decide what is important within your organization? Decisions are how we execute. And if you cannot come to an agreement within a team, within an organization, on what is important, on what you should be working on, if you can't reach decisions, you're not going to be executing. You're not going to be solving problems. You're going to be spinning your organizational wheels. So problem solving. Ultimately, what we are doing when we are arguing with computers is we are trying to solve problems. Now, unfortunately, just like the internet tells me you can't hug every cat, you cannot solve every problem. So what you're gonna to have to do is prioritize. You are going to have to decide what is and isn't important. So be explicit about what is and isn't in scope. Sometimes this can help you solve the build versus buy problem, thinking about, you know, is this particular problem that we're trying to solve what our company is trying to do? So a very recent example, from my own life, uh, 
we decided that we wanted to have some sort of staff directory at Travis CI. I, I thought, I could, I could code one. It would be really cool. It would have all these little fun things. And then I'm like, that is not the problem that Travis CI is trying to solve. So what if I don't spend a whole bunch of engineering time and effort on that? Those are the sorts of trade-offs that you're going to have to make. And again, it helps if you make them explicit rather than implicit. It's also important to pay attention to whose problems you are solving. There's definitely a group of startups that exist. I mean, not any particular group. I don't think it's another cabal. But companies that are solving problems that are mainly only relevant to like rich white tech bros in San Francisco and not really relevant to people outside of that group, pay attention to whose problems you are trying to solve and whose you are ignoring. Like if you are ignoring the fact that like, oh, your platform that you're creating could be used to harass people, that is, that is something that you need to be aware of. So here is my pithy collection of words again. Safety gives us room for empathy. Empathy helps us communicate. Communication improves our decision making. Being able to make decisions well, to make them in a timely manner and to execute on them helps us solve problems and ultimately what we are trying to do is solve problems. We happen to be using computers and software and some hardware and clouds, I think, to do it, but we're solving problems. DevOps was originally trying to break down these metaphorical silos in between you know, the dev team and the ops team to help these teams and these people feel like they had some common goals and purposes rather than being at odds with each other. And this extends far beyond just dev and ops. Any Anytime you have a situation where you have an in-group that's like the cool kids, that's higher status within your organization than the out-group, runs the risk of making, feel, making people feel disconnected, unappreciated, burnt out. Like if you have an organization where the engineers, you know, dev, ops, whatever sort of engineers, get like cool hoodies and they get like the, the cool off-sites and all the good swag and they, they're the ones who have like beer in the office and everyone else gets nothing, that can lead to, to resentment, to people who aren't part of that in-group feeling unappreciated. Disconnecting, feel, feeling disconnected, like you aren't valued, like your work isn't valued, that is this huge contributing factor to burnout. It really sucks to come into work every day and feel like nobody cares what you do or nobody cares about you as a person. So I think that this view of DevOps as having it be about connections can help us make sure that at organizational and industry levels, we aren't burning people out in the process of trying to solve problems. DevOps can help us create and maintain not only effective but humane work environments. And this leads to better work outcomes and business outcomes because, you know, burnt out people aren't giving you their best ideas and their best work because they can't, but also because this is the right thing to do. So it, it comes back to this. DevOps being about creating connections, about finding ways to give people opportunities to connect and contribute as individuals within teams, as teams within an organization, as organizations and individuals within the, within the wider industry. It allows us to connect with each other in meaningful ways that can hopefully address some of the causes of burnout. And these connections to people, to the industry and to the world can help us think about the impact of our work. DevOps creates effective organizations by building bridges in between teams, and it creates effective solutions by building bridges in between people. And when I talk about effective solutions, when I talk about effective problem solving, I'm talking about in the long term, in the bigger picture, not just short term increasing shareholder value. We need people to be able to feel safe raising difficult or uncomfortable questions where we can think about things like, can our platform be used for harassment? Or is this cool new technology using so much energy it's destroying the environment? Or is, is our product that we've created accidentally breaking democracy around the world? We need to be comfortable asking the uncomfortable questions and thinking about the impact that our work has. So DevOps not only lets us ship software more effectively, but it gives us a framework to think about the impact that our work has on the people and the world around us. 
we need to keep thinking about ways to enhance these connections with the work that we do. How we can create more humane work environments that allows us to make better decisions and be better problem solvers, but also make sure that we aren't exacerbating these feelings of disconnect from ourselves, from each other, and from the greater world around us. So I would ask us all to think about the ways that we can connect with each other to help us build these effective, empathetic, and humane teams, organizations, and industry. Thank you. Thank you.